strong into their opponent, but still have good team fighting. And that's yeah. where he really shines is actually, yeah, he built a 20 CS lead, but his best play is oftentimes in those team fights, setting up for the rest of the team. Yeah, and to be fair to Tall 2 as well, this is his rookie split in pro play, period. Not even just internationally, in, in pro play in general. So you got to give him the benefit of the doubt a little bit there. Ari, first lock in here for DFM, and I like that. Ari, extremely good. Got that playmaker. Junjia, though, straight off the bat, he wants a carry for himself. I respect it. Junjia slamming down the Viego pick for him there. Uh, we'll see if he can carry this game. He had a pretty good game, game one, I'd say. We talked about the two early kills that he got at the Rift Herald fight and was able to take over a little bit. Uh, but yeah, the Ari for Arya was absolutely monstrous in that finals performance for him. He rode that champion extremely well, comboing with Steel, and they were able to run away with that game. And we see a Zeri still. Okay, she did receive some nerfs. I know some people, myself included, were hoping that she died <laughs> and with, <laughs> with those nerfs. They were not huge, so it's not too much of a surprise to see her. Probably going to be paired with Lulu. Uh, we'll see if that gets locked in here, because if people are unaware, Melio and... Uh, Yumi are not allowed. They are disabled for this tournament. They are considered too new. And Munchables is dancing oh. that Yumi is not allowed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. No Yumi in the tournament. I'm over the moon on that one. I have no uh, no preconceptions about that. As we look towards PSG on what they want to look. It looks like it's going to be a mid lane pick here, which is a little surprising. Quite often you see in the first rotations the, the jungle and then your AD carry and support locked in. But with the Ari early pickup for Aria, like perhaps PSG feel pressured to get their mid lane locked in and Newbow gonna go for the Lissandra himself. All right, Lissandra coming in, comboing together with the Viego. The fact that you're bringing a little bit more damage from the jungle this time means that they get the setup from the mid lane. No surprise there. Lissandra has been relatively popular in, in recent weeks of in, uh, domestic play, starting to crop up more and more and makes a very strong mid jungle 2v2 if you're able to have enough damage to blow people up and start providing resets for this uh, Viego. And I think this is one of the interesting things about PSG when you looked at their finals, for example, domestically, every single game was quite a different style of draft. This is not the kind of team that just lock one set of champions every single game and, and, and that's the way they win and they just vary based on the bands. Like, this is a team that have multiple pages to their playbook and it feels like they're drilled on the different ways of, of playing the game. They're drilled on the ways to team fight. So excited to see Junja on that carry jungle. Certainly felt like he was like willing to go in in the previous game, getting caught a couple of times, in fact. Yeah, all of PSG actually looking pretty aggressive in that first game. So oh. very strong showing. I will say I was surprised to see the Wukong grab by Seal. Uh, he did have a very good performance on it, but does open up the possibility of that Lulu getting banned out. And that is indeed what PSG did, getting rid of Zeri's favorite champion to combine with currently in the bot lane. I was I'm a little sad to see the Thresh band because I was really hoping Harp would go for his Blitzcrank. Like we've seen Blitzcrank as an answer to the Thresh. This is something Harp did in their finals. Like I would have loved to see it here on the stage. It's a pretty common setup. You know, they see the Thresh, uh, you, or excuse me, you see Jinx or Aphelio select in. Thresh is a great combo. So you leave it up like, oh no, we forgot to ban yeah, the best yeah. pairing. And then you get the counter pick. Uh, we'll say with Zeri being slightly weaker, That's not true. too That's much true. of a surprise to, to not I assume you would want to play that <laughs> with Blitzcrank. He <laughs> yeah. missed the hook and suddenly a very weak lane phase. Probably going to try and find an Enchanter um, to pair the, the Zeri up with. Yeah, certainly. The Orn hovered there, I will say, could be a big pick across the course of this tournament. A lot of people talking about that as a top laner. But the Gragas, more standard, something we've been seeing across the course of this year, likely to go up towards Azure in that top lane with our jungle and mid already locked in. But now for DFM, they're going to round this composition out. Yeah, we'll see what they want to go for. Uh, we talked about how Toltu, for the most part, is pretty much strictly on tank duty. 12 games to Gragas, 8 of Scion, 6 of Sante, 4 Malphite. So you don't really have to worry about the counter pick uh, coming in too much here. So it makes sense that they, they grab this one for Aji, as well as the double AP soul laners. But you have the AD carry threat, a little bit of uh, Junjia coming in from the side lane, or from the jungle, excuse me, to these, these uh, laners. We'll see what they want to combo with. Of course, Cassante coming in for Toll 2. Hopefully this time gets the better uh, of the matchup. Obviously it was on the Malphite last time, but yeah, Cassante really took him to town. It kind of reminds me of that, uh, there was a Donkey video years and years ago where he was like, oh, I know this is my favorite champion in the game. Gets killed by someone who's like, this is the best champion in the game. Gets killed by someone else, this is the best. I feel like that's exactly what Toll 2's doing. D died to the Cassante? Okay, I'm gonna play Cassante myself. Uh, we get a Renata, though, All locked right. in for a harp. I feel like it's a little while since I've seen a Renata. Yeah, Renata uh, did drop off a little bit, but still played somewhat. Obviously, a very strong team fighting champion. You still have the hook as well, technically, with the Q coming in. Uh, a lot of the buffs for the rest of the team. A very strong team fight ultimate. And kind of do it. feels like what DFM is going to go for a little bit here. 
Woody flexing, maybe? Yes! Oh, he actually locked it in. All right, we get the first Blitz Crank of the tournament. I expect we'll be seeing a lot more of this champion. Just so powerful, it yeah. feels like, these days. You know, I thought it was going to be half. I was wrong on that one, but we still do get that Blitz Crank. I'm here for it. Woody bringing it out. There's a snake in his boots today, that is for sure. <laughs> oh, no. But we'll see what PSG are going to bring. But I'm curious, on, especially with the Renata in the mix here, like, talk me through the, the DF comp DFM composition. Like, how do you go about playing the game? Because it feels like they don't have that much engage outside of the Wukong. No, it definitely feels a little bit more like a counter-engage focused team comp. I guess in a sense you can say that it will be relatively short range with Jinjia and Yubao needing to go flying in to kind of the back line. And with the Renata ult, you can kind of shoot that over the top. It's a very telegraphed engage in a lot of ways from Yubao. If you see this claw coming in, um, you can then be ready to press your R. And as soon as she actually takes it, you finish that off. And then it kind of blocks the follow-up from coming through. And maybe Lissandra's stranded in your team and you kind of focus her down. Uh, it also did require a little bit more engage for the team because they were a little low on engage. Renata, she's very difficult if you're just supposed to shoot that out blindly at the start of a fight. Very easy to sidestep that, but if you're following up off of Wukong or something like that, um, it does make a little bit of sense for them there. It certainly does. But we're headed towards the second game now. DFM, it is a best of three. They get a second opportunity here to, to show us what they're made of here in London at MSI 2023. And there is a lower bracket if it all goes wrong, but they're hoping to push us to three here, and I'm hoping they do too. It's the first series of the day. It's the first series of the tournament. Let's hope for three games. Yeah, let's show off this new tournament strength. Show us a best of three. Of course, like you said, they'll still be live no matter what at the end of this game, but I definitely want to see a little bit more out of DFM. Felt a little disappointed in game one. We'll see if they can bounce back here in game two. We certainly will. PSG, though, looking good. Looking good for the PCS's Woody. Moving towards a stack of players on the enemy team. He's on that Blitzcrank, which you do have to be scared of. We could see, though, there's no one alongside him. Don't forget, though, everyone at home, you can get your Prime Gaming emotes, connect your League of Legends account, and you can grab yourself that Gotham emote. So make sure you're getting involved online. Any primers in chat? <laughs> I don't know if you can even subscribe to this channel. A question for another day. PSG, though, feeling good. Starting good, like everything, I think, just rocking and rolling for them. DFM, though, we want to see proactivity. We want to see them making things happen. And Harp was absolutely on it with the threshing game number one. I want to see those handshakes out from his Renata. I want to see that same skill shot accuracy. Yeah, it was definitely the best performing member of DFM. I think you can make that case. All of the good plays that the team had kind of came off the back of his hooks. He almost got them that mid-game team fight before the side of PSG turned it around. So definitely had my eye on him, especially on such a huge playmaking champion like the Renata. Here we see already some early invade by Jinjia. Pretty much blind. I don't, I'm not sure if they had any vision down. It doesn't look like it. So uh, going in just knowing that Steel's gonna be starting up on the top side there. Yeah, I don't know if he somehow discerned this based on Woody kind of poking his nose in earlier, but I feel like, I, I don't know how you would <laughs> manage to discern that from that lack of information. Uh, but yeah, Junja. He's yeah, gonna no. get himself a free invade. I just uh, went back, scrubbed through it very quickly. Looks pretty much blind. He was standing on his point up on his own Raptor camp before wrapping around down to the bot side and just kind of getting a read. I mean, this is one of the things that I, I also particularly love about series um, in general. Best of three, a little bit shorter, but in, especially in best of fives, is being able to pick up on habits that you're starting to see out of enemies. So if you know that this guy tends to just default into basic clears, full clears, things like that, then you can get really aggressive in here. Junjiya doesn't just take uh, the Raptor camp. He takes the entire oh, no. bot side of Steel there. Oh, so close from Toll 2, and that would have been redemption right there. But Junja already down in the bottom lane right here. Woody looking for the hook, but Dude upon over the wall. Woody's just hit level 2 as well as Harp stepping there, but it's Waco to go low despite it being a 2v3. Yeah, not bad. Obviously, PSG stepping forward to kind of force onto that play. Does get some sums out. Harp losing his flash, Udipon losing his ghost. But I think overall, you got to be pretty happy for DFM to get out of what was a very risky setup there. Junji not able to land the stun that he initially sent out there. And this is buying Toll 2 kind of on an island to go ahead and push his top lane advantage as much as he wants. Steel with nothing to do in the bot side of the map, actually now going for a counter invade. His bot lane does have priority. So we'll see here Harp starting to move up in the river to collapse with Steel and try and force down onto this blue buff. And See how dicey they're willing to get with this. Yeah, Waco currently resetting as he moves back towards the play. Woody does have a ward, so full information onto Steel. But if they can buy just a little bit of time for Waco to rejoin the play, they should be able to deny the invade from Steel. It doesn't feel like Steel is that confident to really force the issue here. But as I say that, he does move back in. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't have much else to do on the map. It's going to be hard to move off to the top side. He could do it, given the control that Toll 2 has. Maybe try and cut through mid lane through the Ari lane. 
Um, instead, he's just going to fall back onto the Scuttle Crab here, providing pressure for Utapon to keep kind of shoving up this bot lane. You can already see a pretty big CS lead starting to develop for Utapon. Um, so even though it was very annoying to lose that many camps to Junjia, the fact that he spent that much time doing that did allow a lot of the pushing lanes to auto win. Here you see Steel doing that kind of cross map up to the other Scuttle Crab here, and we'll see if he actually wants to keep trying to invade onto this Viego. So far, we are four minutes into the game. Junja has not taken a single one of his buffs, and yet he's almost 10 CS up on Steel. He's going to jump over the wall, though, and will smite away this Krug. Junja getting the vast majority of the little mini Krugs there, though. Gets himself some rocks. The Steel, speaking of, wait, you're a tourist in the UK. Get yourself some rock. It's uh, no idea what that is. It's like a stick of sugar, essentially. Uh, get it from the sea. I, I, I got to tell you, no Joe, you're not, sell you're not selling me too hard. It's on really the tasty, okay? You <laughs> okay. Can, they like write little words on the inside of it. It's cool. Wow, cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, look I'm not, I don't work for TripAdvisor. This is not my forte. <laughs> yeah. you, you have been my tour guide kind of since, since I've arrived here. You've, you've taken me out to, to dinner quite a few times. But all right, DFM taking the PSG a little bit on here. I, I'm very happy to see Toll having a slightly better performance here, getting some good trades up in the top side. Utapon as well, up in lane phase. Uh, the fact that Goldie is even after that initial invade means that they've done a very good job in their lanes, staying even with PSG this time around. Moving towards this mid lane here, Aria rooted up. This could be huge. It's nice a great stun. charm, and it's enough to get Aria out. No summoners available. Yubao still has that flash, so it could be an opportunity later. Udupon goes aggressive, but Woody disengaging that one. Nice little hook on the Udupon there, but Renata, pretty strong laner at the end of the day with the range harass, the handshakes, the shields, all that stuff. So able to stay up in lane. And there you see the fact that Arya lost his flash is going to be pretty big. Uh, does enable more opportunities. Obviously still a very mobile champion at six, but maybe there's enough burst damage to finish her off through a full combo between Junjia and Yubao now. Yep, and Junja starting the strike off. And this is, you know, in the previous game, we were 12 minutes and we saw the first strike. This is more what we expected from PSG. I, they love a Drake. I assume that's the entirety of their analysis of game one is their coach was just like, you should have got Drake Dragon earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely, even this time, despite the pressure that they kind of had in the bot lane, the fact that they got that gank off in the mid side, they instantly transferred that down to Dragon and they begin the PSG tried and true game plan of Drake stacking. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, like, you can't really go wrong. Assuming you have the priority and you have the ability to do it, this is exactly what they've done domestically. And honestly, it's one of the questions that I've got for PSG moving into this tournament, moving into international players. Domestically, they've been fantastic in stacking those neutrals and being able to just do it through priority, figuring out when your opponent Whoa. is going to reset. Woody channeling his inner light you here as he finds Heart with a hook, but the handshake turning it around. Yudpon still full HP. This could be a disaster as Yudpon trying to chase for more. Still on. has the flash available. Ghost channeled away as he's getting the damage onto Woody. Can and they finish it. Yes, they can. Utapon with first blood. Woody hooks Harp underneath the turret, but that is not the threat there. And Utapon takes that moment where there's no longer any threat available to dash in and find first blood and a long chase down. You gotta believe somebody poisoned the water hole or something there. <laughs> Woody goes down. It's Utapon finding the advantage early on. And it's important as well, because comparatively to game number one, like Wako had this Aphelios and just scaled for free. Got so many plays, like had a free early game. He was chilling. This time around, it's Utapon getting ahead. Yeah, nice to see. They also had some good trades earlier on in, in that game for DFM. And here you see, while you do land Harp, he was at full health and you can't 100 to zero him. Now your cooldowns are down and you haven't actually lowered the big threat on the team. So now Utapon just pops his ghost and you have this entire lane on Zeri to just pew pew them down, chase them up. Uh, Woody there just getting popped and there's the, the shield seal to get nerfed a little bit by uh, the Zeri, but not yeah. the, the biggest deal at the end of the day. And, Nice kill. I feel like we see like the strength and weakness of Blitzcrank in that play, right? Like the initial play, fantastic. Gets the hook, gets the knock up. The entire rest of the replay, all he does is walk around because Blitzcrank's cooldowns are absurdly long. I mean, everyone falls prone to it. I went, whoa, the whole crowd went, whoa, but we'll have to see if he can make a better use of the Blitzcrank here the Rift Herald fight. Jojo will walk away. Zubao moving over as well. You can see Adja moving over. And apologize to Adja if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, I believe it is pronounced Adju, but, you know, my weak English tongue cannot, <laughs> cannot maintain it. Woody knocked up here. He's going to be caught out and with no flash available. you got to believe it's another pick for DFM. This is what we wanted to see. 
this is the pace we wanted. Yeah, DFM being much more aggressive this time around, finding angles. We'll see if Toll's in trouble here, though. He should be able to just hop over the wall to steal, maybe, oh, if he's got it up. Good luck for a fight. Honestly, steals just over oh. the wall. The all out comes out for Toll, too. Juncture not quite on the right side of the wall. Forced to ult himself as Harp has moved on over as well. The knockback onto Adja. Oh, the hostile takeover doesn't quite connect, but Toltu does not care about that one. Steel finds yet another kill, and this is a snowball that has begun to roll. Man, DFM is just picking PSG apart. They don't want to back off that play. Very cute idea by Toltu. I think he wanted to actually get him into the pit. Ended up hitting him all the way across the, the Scuttle or Herald pit wall, as opposed to hitting him next to the, the yeah. uh, Wukong, which is, I think, what he was going for with that Flash ultimate. But at the end of the day, there were still so many resources available that they could get that chase down. Harp's ult was kind of angled, assuming he would flash closer to the Viego, ended up flashing further over the wall. And you can see that's absolutely fine because there was still plenty of chase down available for the rest of DFM. Get those two kills. For PSG, the one upside is that you have managed to keep the Rift Herald up alive. Yep. So you can keep your uh, perfect neutral objective control <laughs> for the series. Yeah, despite all of that, PSG are actually still the ones that get onto the Herald and off the back of those resets from both Toltu and Harp. Will be Junja finishing this objective off. Next Drake spawning in 70 seconds as well. So you can expect PSG to book it down towards that bottom side. Yeah, Woody in this replay, you can see just kind of caught between two paths to go to. No longer having flash up means he's a very easy kill for them to find there. Get that one. And then here's this kind of sequence I was talking about where he told two is going to try and flash to the far side of Aje, I believe it was, uh, or maybe it was Junjia, and try and ult him into the pit here once he sees him visible, but just that little back step to the yeah. left sets up the angle incorrectly, so it hits him to the far side of the wall there, but because Harp is still in the range, Steel easily can get over the wall, that still is a good way to start this fight and allow the rest of the event to collapse and kind of focus these members down. Yeah, and little mechanical mistakes like that are tough, because that feels like the difference between a fight where you get a singular pick and can't quite finish Herald, and taking out the enemy jungler and giving you that wide open opportunity. And to be fair, maybe he actually did do that sidestep intentionally to hit it closer to Harp. I yeah, thought he was trying possibly, to hit it to yeah. Steel, but maybe he thinks it's, it's better to set that up closer to the uh, Renata. So, could have been, could have been the case there. Uh, but either way, DFM do lose the, the Rift Herald there, and I think this is one of the things that PSG does very well, uh, even in losing game states, finding ways to get these neutral objectives, and uh, it's a bit of a a crutch in the sense that like we're not going to always win every single skirmish every single fight but we can continue getting resources in our favor by getting these small advantages from the gold from plates yeah. hopefully or uh, even just denying it and stopping the snowball that dfm could be getting if they had that herald yeah. as uh, speaking of dfm they're gonna look to stop the dragon stacking from psg this could be their first rake of the tournament they can uh, just find that objective but Junja very much aware of the situation has that herald to try and push a lane with if he wants but Woody's here charging into the play wants to find a hook for himself it's gonna be a full-on 4v4 as Yubao enters the fray as well Junja is he can try to go for a steal as the all-in comes out that's a nice little moonlight vigil as well Woody in the middle of everything still low on HP Dragon gets low but steal grabs it no in fact it was Unipon to finish the job gets a kill for himself as well looking for more as he dives over the wall Wacko flashed on oh. and now Adja in a 1v1 with his area I don't think he can win that one it's a double for Yudapont Upon. On this far side of the play, though, Steel and Arya got dropped. I believe it was Yubao picking one of those up. We'll see now the teleport out. <laughs> the chicken's able, trying to punish. Able to survive there. Uh, ends up being a very scrappy fight. Like you said, the Unipon of all people securing the dragon, but very clean mechanics. Nice backstep there on the Aji body slam. Yeah. Very clean stuff out of DFM. Continuing to kind of uh, get this Goldie going, stop the dragon stacking of PSG, but a very scrappy fight. Yeah, and you know, we talked about Unipon being the franchise player like him on DFM is the second longest standing player on any team in the entire world only Faker beats him by a month and a day take another look yeah here's this split fight you saw a lot of resources used onto Arya early on forcing out to the left side of the fight steel as well able to basically try and get out here tries to get healed no way has to run through Yubao Ends up going down, then Yubao finds Arya yet again, actually flashes forward, finished him off, while Yudapon was making that play on the right side of the map, able to kind of make it an even fight overall, I believe it was. But this TP here, very cheeky, very, very sneaky to be able to get out of there. Yeah, manages to escape, but now PSG answer by trying to make a play on the bottom side for plates. One play taken already by Wako just then. The Herald, hand shook away. Can they actually deny this one? Steel's moving over, has the smite available. They've got to hit the eye with an auto. It's not going to happen. So the plates will go across to PSG, but it's only two. 
Definitely not the same level of snowballing that Wako was able to receive last game around, but still very nice for them to be able to try and keep pace with this Zeri. Yes, he does have his uh, Mythic completed first, but Zeri obviously with the three kills up a little bit of gold, about 500 currently in her back pocket. So there you see Mythic completed just now back in base. Um, and DFM feeling a lot better this game. I think in terms of scaling, in terms of team fighting, both times the drafts have been very similar. Uh, we, we didn't touch on it too much in the previous game, but, but a lot of the ways that these teams are going to team fight is, is very similar where you have these kind of weak side, more tank oriented top laners, scrappy junglers, scrappy mid laners, a very hard scaling AD carry in both games, and then this time around, uh, playmaking support. So it's going to come a lot down to execution, vision control, setup, these kinds of things, and that is something that PSG has done extremely well in, in both domestically and in game one here, which yeah. does enable Woody to hopefully start landing some more impactful hooks. Uh, that's the big thing, right? When you play through vision control, and you've got a Blitzcrank. That's so hard to face check into, man. Like, hey, Toltu basically the only one. May I guess Steel as well can use his, his clone to try and block some of those hooks, but it's scary to try and fight for vision against a Blitzcrank. Yeah, if you see it coming, it's not too hard to clone backwards and, and make that thing eat the, the skill shot. But if you're doing it blind, that's a much harder reaction uh, test right there. Uh, unfortunately for Woody not having the best game, how many Toy Story puns do you have prepared if Woody keeps dying? Do you have any good ones? Like, it seems like you've, you've spent a lot of research on the Toy Story puns. I've got to be honest, they weren't actually necessarily prepped. It's just Toy Story puns come naturally. It's the me, mind of know? Munchables. It's incredible. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible thing, uh, watching Toy Story. I did it a lot <laughs> as a kid. I was one of those kids that, like, Puts on a movie and then just puts it on again and then just puts oh, it on you're, again. You're the, Toy the, Story the was on that list for me. Watcher. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Disgusting. <laughs> oh, right. Should Sorry. always should always be watching new things. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't that fussed about optimization as a kid, but <laughs> but there you have it. You know, different strokes for different folks. Uh, it's a uh, just over 1,000 gold lead right now for DFM over PSG. And this is what we wanted to see, right? We came in saying we wanted a little bit more from DFM. And it feels like game number two, the jitters are gone. It feels like we're seeing that team that we saw in the LJL. Yeah, forcing fights, getting more aggressive here, and already kind of swapping up the lane assignments despite the fact that all outer turrets are still available. Putting Utapon into the mid lane already. Arya in the side lane with that ultimate, very safe there. And they kind of want to sit on this Lissandra to limit her playmaking. Also gives them easier access to the mid lane. Yep. And as long as you don't get hooked by uh, Woody while you're Arya in the side lane, it's actually a pretty pretty low chance that PSE can make a play onto you. Woody could, oh no, the Cyclone doesn't actually land and Junja throws his stun out to try and buy space. The Blast Cone! It's a Mega Cone as well. And Woody gets out with his life. That was, that could have been so unlucky. Off of the Scryer's Bloom happening to be procced as he was in the Dragon's Pit. Oh boy, that, that's, that's actually kind of painful there. They, they are able to force them back and we'll get pressure around this and maybe drop this turret, but Dragon is spawning in 20 seconds. It's a very long cooldown by Harp. Uh, people were noting there are a couple little UI issues uh, that we're, we're getting sorted out. So it's about a quarter of the way off cooldown. So quite a while. We'll not have that for Dragon. If PSG are able to get enough tempo to kind of force that one down. You saw the idea there. Combo it with the Wukong ult. That's kind of what we were talking about in, in the draft. But just a little too slow on the trigger finger there and the Blast Cone saving their lives. And this is what I was talking about. PSG, knowing that those two critical teamfight ultimates are down, are probably going to be able to grab this one uncontested by DFM. Yeah. Not the most impactful soul. Obviously, there's been a lot of conversation about that across the course of this year, the Chemtech soul being one of the, the least favorites of them, but can still be very, very valuable, um, especially when you're later on in those team fights, especially when you're running with a, a tank Gragas up in the top side. Yeah, definitely the case. Uh, I was a big uh, zombie soul fan. <laughs> no, I was not. <laughs> Surely not. A absolutely not. But I will say for, for PSG, it does feel really good to, like we said, find these kind of footholds in a game where you are losing the fact that uh, DFM blew all those resources. While it didn't work out, I do like the aggressiveness. I wouldn't want DFM's takeaway from that play to be like, oh, we should have held those cooldowns for the, the neutral objective fight. It's like, no, you should have just executed slightly better, find that kill, because I do want them to keep that level of aggression up. Yep. Instead, they just flip up to the top side and grab that Rift Herald for free after PSG grab the dragon. And uh, talking about the differences between game one and two so far, I want to give a quick shout out to Toll 2, because it, it's night and day, game number one versus game number two here. It felt like he was very nervous in game number one, remember, this is his rookie split in professional play uh, at, at the top level, certainly, at least. And yeah. so making it to MSI is already a big achievement. Now showing up with a CS lead in game number two, two assists. His Cassante looking pretty good. I, I'm feeling good for him. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure when I was watching the LGL finals, they were 
done remotely, actually, if, if uh, I'm not mistaken. So playing in front of a big crowd like this on this crazy-ass Mortal Kombat stage, <laughs> whatever this is, like, I, I can see this getting to, like you said, a rookie player um, and having a rough game one and bouncing back in game two. Really glad to see him with that 30 CS lead. He was getting torn apart, I will say, in some of the online comments I saw. Had a uh, pretty unimpactful Malphite game, uh, but looking much better this time around. That's what happens when you lock in the Shamrock Malphite skin. <laughs> it's out of his hands, what can I say? <laughs> uh, we're in England, not Ireland. <laughs> Factor and Ashida are going to kill me for that one. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a pretty nice game, though, for DFM. I will say, fairly slow pace still, and uh, not necessarily like leveraging their advantage, but then again, when your advantage is on a Zeri, yes, you've got the two items, but still a while away from being that like terrifying late-game Zeri that we all dread. Yeah, I mean, Zeri is the champion where you don't need to keep brute forcing these plays. The fact, like we said, that the scaling is relatively even for DFM. You can kind of using this pressure to try and find those level of pickoffs. If you get them, great. If not, you can just go into these uh, neutral objective standoffs, pretty much even footing in terms of a comp perspective. And they are definitely ahead with where the gold is located. Yes, it's a 2,000 gold lead overall, but it does feel very good for Udupon in particular to be up 1,000 gold and, and further along. I'm just trying to get cheeky with it here. This is something he's kind of known for domestically, having great flanks for the team fights. TP being channeled as Herald has dropped in the mid lane. Oh boy. Feels like we're posturing for a fight here, Mark. Yes, sir. You can see Aja coming in on the backside, wants to get an alt and knock people into the turret. This could be massive is he, if he can find Udupon still. Flashes away, Udupon knocked up, knocked back. The rest of the team can't follow up though, because Toll too making a pay the Toll on the backside of the play. Woody next to go down as Aria gets the resets, and suddenly PSG are torn asunder. PSG tried to make that play happen. We all saw it coming, but they did not coordinate it quite well enough, and DFM were able to absorb that pressure, turn that fight around, find three kills, mid lane turret with the Rift Herald down, and at perfect timing, the Baron spawns at the very end of that fight. DFM are going to try and force this one down. We'll see if PSG can stop it. They don't want to let it go for free. Aja in the area. You bow, moving towards the bottom side, actually. I don't think there's a contest here no. at all. This is Baron taken by DFM, showing up in game two. DFM already showing the benefits of the new format for MSI, having a rough game one. Maybe it was jitters, maybe it was just the level of play that they had, but this time in game two, answering back strong. Yubao going in a little bit ahead of the play. Aja is not quite there in time to land the ultimate. You want that root at the same time that Aja would be knocking everyone into the team. He does knock Yudapon in, but at this point, they've already blown too many other of the resources down. You already can see that Waka was just blown up by Toltu diving into the backside of that fight, and they just get torn apart. The coordination not quite there for PSG. Yeah, Woody goes down right at the end there. Where's Buzz when you need him, eh? <laughs> oh, my God. And uh, you could see happy faces across the staff at DFM, and rightly so, as they begin their Red Bull power play. And we'll see what they can get done with this Baron, because PSG in game number one, they basically took the entire map apart with that Baron buff. We've got to see if DFM can have a similar showing, but they've got the gold lead to work with, right? What, 5,000 up currently in their favor. We'll see if they can keep on snowballing that. 5,000 gold lead in their favor, not great wave clear on the side of PSG. You do have the, basically the Gragas barrels and Lissandra Q, but it is kind of hard to actually stop a push here coming in. So they're going to melt this first turret down here, already moving over to the mid lane. DFM has pretty good vision control set up for this map movement over to the side. Aja, though, is waiting in the top side of the map. Woody could look for a hook here. And, you know, I feel like Banshees on Ari has had a lot of flame over the year. There's been a lot of conversation about the, Ari builds. The when no you're damage against, builds. Yeah. yeah, when you're against Blitzcrank, I like, the, I like the Banshees here. It means you can be just that little bit more aggressive. And not a ton of tools on the side of PSG to poke that one off. I feel like that's where sometimes people tunnel on what it can prevent without realizing what's up. Cyclone comes in, Aria over the wall as well. Aja just caught in the middle of everyone. Tries to escape and almost does, but taken down in the end. And DFM continue to push forwards. Baron in pocket, five members strong in the mid lane. It's Toll 2, might have gone too deep for this one. They've run out of minions as well. He's knocked up, he's under the top of the all out, pulls him out to safety and flips the play on his head. DFM are looking good. Hell of a game two by Toll2 here, already 2-0-4. Nice CS lead for himself, baiting the rest of PSG in, finding that kill, not able to grab the inhibitor turret on the tail end of it, but falling back to Dragon, grabbing their second of the game, and a much larger gold lead, up to 8,000. A nice 3,500 gold Baron buff power play. And again, like you say, denying soul point. Another Drake for DFM. Another neutral denied from PSG.
And it feels like we have to go, oh, we'll do the replay and then I'll go into that one. All right, well here you see it's just easy as uh, the turret's beginning to drop. You can go in and finish off the turret for Utapon and make that dive happen. Aja just no flash, no way out of that situation was still on cooldown from the previous fight, able to finish him off. And then here you can see how tanky Cole 2 is, just the fact that there's so many ultimates being dropped on top of him. And he uses the Kasanti ultimate as an escape to get out from underneath the turret while also delivering a target for DFM to focus down there. Yeah, I feel like Woody maybe needed to acknowledge the fact that all out's available. Like you can't <laughs> stand behind that guy right there, uh, Tol 2. Get it out with his life. And like we said before, fantastic game number two from Tol 2. And we have to go back to a conversation that we brought up earlier on in game number one, right at the very start. We said PSG, they come in with a clear cut plan, but everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And I feel like DFM, they're finally throwing that punch. Yeah, you can see DFM having a much better game too. And for PSG, I, I kind of referenced it a little bit earlier, but like the North American fan in me, having watched TSMs and Team Liquids of old, where there's this very heavy focus on scaling and control, and because you're the best team in your region, you kind of default win your lanes, and people don't play you quite normally, and you're able to kind of scale, and DFM, I think, respected PSG a little bit too much in Game 1, and in Game 2, forcing a lot more often. TB coming out from DFM here as they want to try and find the fight, and they might have just found it as well. Wako taken down by Arya, who finds the backline and finds those charms, finds the resets, finds everything for DFM. DFM punish and collapse so quickly. This is one of the things that they are incredible at, is the angles of playmaking. They can come from all over the map. The teleport coming in there from Arya, finding Wako on the backside of that fight able to finish him off, does give them the path to grab this mid lane inhibitor turret. We'll see how far they want to go here. Oh, a knockback as well. This could be the snowball. A pick onto Yubao as the tower is taken down. Yubao with the double Zonius keeps himself alive for a little bit longer. Not long enough as he's taken down. It won't be the end of the game, but it will be a mid lane inhib. Mid lane inhib taken for free, basically a minute before Baron is back alive. So all the summoners and spells, or excuse me, ultimates and spells used there will be back available for DFM when they're Neutral objective response, just such a nice pick off there, punishing PSG stepping forward for that vision control. Utapon feeling fantastic in these fights as well. When everything is set up on your terms, you can see just three fires away during all of this chaos. Yeah, I thought for sure that this was not going to develop into a fight, but the overchase here by Jinjia wanting to get on top of Steel, not knowing that Harp was sitting on the backside of that uh, brush, and then the teleport in from Arya was instantaneous, ready to immediately follow up on that team and find all those extra kills, just the coordination by DFM there. And uh, the, the creativity, it doesn't always come from draft as we see our first pause <laughs> of the tournament, baby, let's go. I mean, it's day number one of MSI. Without without a pause, it would, uh, something would be amiss, right? I feel like this is almost, it's tradition at this point. Of course it is. I, you know how people do those 90, 50, 10 predictions? <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was trolling Reddit earlier and I saw that one, one of the 90% predictions was a pause. Whoever that is, congratulations, you hit your 90. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, bold prediction, to yeah. say the very least. Uh, I will, we'll update you as soon as we know uh, what's going on and hopefully get back into the game. But you do have to wonder on, on, on things like momentum for DF. I mean, like, let's be honest, they're very, very far ahead at this point. I feel like even with conversations of momentum, they're feeling pretty strong. But uh, a pause can sometimes alter that a little bit. Yeah, you start stewing, you start getting in your own head, you realize you're on a stage again from this like kind of flow state that you're in. It, it definitely can pull you out a little bit. Uh, like you said, fortunately far enough ahead this game that's probably not going to throw too big of a wrench in their plans. Um, and it's more about, you know, we started getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves in game one, talking about game two. Here it's already feeling like what's going to happen in game three. Um, because I, I did want to gas up DFM a little bit, um, not just about draft creativity, but in-game creativity and the angles that they come from yeah. um, and the kinds of plays that they're willing to do. And it's exactly why I, I go back to this play again in game one where you had Steel sneak into that bot lane brush and he didn't pull the trigger on that play. But that's exactly the kind of stuff that this team does so well is like camp brushes from weird angles where like, yep. okay, if someone was in there, surely they would have jumped out by now and they just have this level of patience that uh, some teams are not quite prepared for. And I think you could see it a little bit there where PSG was like, okay, if anyone was going to collapse and try and save Steel, surely they would have shown up by now. And then out of nowhere, the rest of DFM emerges. And I think um, it's something that can surprise a lot of teams, especially a team like PSG, who is so used to slow, yeah. controlled play. It's almost like uh, guerrilla warfare style yeah. of League of Legends, you know, where you can never quite know where they're going to come from. You can never quite know what's going to happen. DFM, they bring that element of chaos into the game. And we'll see if they can continue to bring that to the stage here today. Game faces on. I see some people clicking away. I think we might be ready to jump back in shortly. Yeah, we'll have to see if we can 
get back in the game in a second here. Um, but yeah, I think for, for DFM, looking very good, showing a lot more of their personality in game two. And it's, like we said, a, a big benefit to the new MSI format, the ability to kind of weather that game one storm, any potential problems you might be seeing, and then uh, immediately bounce back in game two, more centered, more focused. And for, for some teams, especially some of these teams that don't get to play on, on huge stages, huge finals and these kinds of things, you know, it might be the first time you're in a venue like this where yeah. uh, the pressure can kind of get to you. Yeah, and they will get, whichever team loses today, they will get at least one second opportunity. Mm -hmm. I do actually want to take this moment to, to mention a, a little storyline that could show up a little bit later in the tournament. And that's that at 2022 Worlds, uh, DFM played against Loud in their first ever international oh. best of five. They managed to win that series. And uh, there's a lot of Brazilian fans in today that, yeah. are, that are looking towards Loud. If we see DFM versus Loud in either side of the bracket, that, that could start to become a bit of an international grudge match. I, I got to say, DFM, because you, you heard the analysts talking about it, have attended so many international tournaments. They have been to every single international tournament except 2020 Worlds, I believe it was. Uh, they've only missed one. And so they, they've started to develop these rivalries with a bunch of teams. Cloud9 is an example of another team that uh, ended up getting beaten in, in some matches against <laughs> DFM or played some close series as well. And, you know, obviously they're waiting off in the main bracket stage for Cloud9. But if by some some strong level of performance. I didn't want to call it a miracle, <laughs> but by some miracle, DFM advances all the way through and grabs one of the three slots available. You know, they could suddenly start having rematches versus Cloud9. Uh, it could get uh, real juicy. It could yeah. get real exciting. Uh, apparently, there is an issue with the in-game camera uh, locking for PSG's Woody. So hopefully, we can get that resolved and, and get, us, get ourselves back into the game and get things rolling. I think all of us, I, I can't speak for everyone, but at least I have experienced that problem where your camera just locks and then yeah. you click the yeah, button, yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. unlock. And you have Mashing Y, and, it's, yeah. and, and, and all you're doing is just spamming your chat. And you're like, wait a second. <laughs> we are back into the game, though. As soon as we say the reason for the pause, apparently it magically fixed itself. And we're back onto some of this rift once again. DFM looking down the barrel of their first win of MSI if they can tie a bow on this one. They've got the mid in hip down. There's Baron up on the map. It feels like they've got the tools to finish this one, but PSG are never a team that you can quite count out. No, absolutely not. With this Baron up available, we'll see how aggressive DFM wants to get. It is a situation where if they're not careful, start a risky Baron, Flaps comes in, you get blown up. Could be a dicey situation, but they're so far ahead, playing so confident right now. Oh, Toll 2 behind enemy lines here. Junja having to all out of the play. Toll 2 wanting to find some knockups, but knocked back himself. The Everfrost, the cast from Aja, and a great disengage from PSG. Oh, a little bit gun shy, I think, by Toll 2 there. It was a very nice play by Steel to kind of force the entirety of PSG into that mid lane. You saw Jinji have to ult over the wall, and I thought for sure this is where Toll 2 is just going to ult someone right back to the rest of the team. But uh, instead, kind of slow played that fight, gave PSG the window to get out. Now that's a lot of ultimates down for the side of DFM. We've got a pincer play coming through. DFM ready. As the Berserk actually keeps him walking away. Aja locked up in the team, flashes out to safety. Uh -oh. Told to locked up as Wako is firing away, flashes into the play, and the follow up is there from PSG. Aja now denying Told to knocks him up and takes him out as Junja getting resets in the backside of the play. And PSG, against all odds, find their mark. PSG absorbed the engage by DFM, kited out, and Wako sees his moment to flash in with a monstrous. Aphelios ultimate there, finishing off multiple members of DFM and buying PSG their foothold back into this game. Gonna grab a Baron on the tail end of that fight. Look, PSG say you can take one Mountain Drake, you can take a Chemtech Drake, but you cannot take our Baron. Oh man, you can see here Harp just doesn't quite angle the ultimate far enough back to catch people with the slope from the Everfrost. Like you said, only Aji there getting knocked, uh, excuse me, Berserk, he's still going to run backwards. And then here, they're just kind of getting pelted by Wako, who finally sees his opportunity to flash alt, Gale Force in, Q spam them. Insane play by Wako there, seeing his angle and forcing the rest of DFM back, getting them low, allowing Junji to start picking up resets as well. Super clean fight there for PSG after we saw that flub kind of engage out of DFM. Yeah, faces lighting up there for PSG. And I think a lot of people coming into the tournament saying, that Gigabin was going to be the, the biggest Giga Chad of play-ins. Well, Wako putting his hat in the ring there saying, look, I've got some Chad in me too. I mean, this is why we were hyping up Wako as this guy with gold in his pocket is such a fearsome team fighter and why PSG trusts him so much is because he knows the exact moment 
when he can finally go in on the back foot all game long. And as soon as he sees his angle, he makes that team fight all about him. Yeah, so DFM still gra grabbing a tower up in the top side here. You can see gold lead. Prilf's still pretty significantly in favor of DFM. Still DFM with the goalie, like you said. They do have pretty strong scaling in their back pocket still. It doesn't mean that the game is over because they lost that one team fight. But it is kind of that momentum stopper that we were talking about. You hit this pause temporarily. You come back in. Your first two fights don't go well. The first one kind of forcing the mid lane. You didn't find the angle. Then you lose this one. You lose Baron. Gold lead starts going over to PSG. Gold lead slipping away. Sometimes, despite still being stronger in the game, you can feel like you're behind. I will say it's a very good sign that DFM has not really let off the pressure. The fact that they did lose that fight but still have PSG corralled on their side of the map speaks to the fact that DFM doesn't seem too daunted by the fact that that fight did not go well. DFM still, like you say, putting the best foot forward. Junja, well, what I've seen actually from Junja this game, he's consistently charging forwards to try and throw a skill shot or a Q at Arya to deny that Banshee so that Woody has targets. He's constantly moving forwards to try and make sure those spell shields aren't in play. Absolutely love that kind of in-game problem solving. I was talking about it, how the, the Banshee's Veil doesn't really have someone who can easily proc it off of and it makes it very good against the Blitzcrank, where sometimes you build it and there's someone who very easily can land some poke against it, like a Corky, and then you're like, why did I build this in the first place? No. Here, like you said, Junjiya realizing that, hey, someone needs to pop this off so Arya doesn't feel safe just flying into our team and, and forcing these kinds of engages with the Everfroster charm. And I feel like we're getting to a point where with three drakes in favor of PSG, three minutes until that next one. The Baron gonna fall off here. It is a significant uh, Red Bull power play for them, but it's very much a, a comeback power play, right? It, that's just bringing them into the game again. But they're still 4K down, and we're looking towards Utapon, as DFM often have in the past, to be the big carry in these fights. He's on four items on the Zeri. Feels like this is his moment to make a mark. Yeah, the longest standing member of DFM, second longest standing player on an organization of any team in the world here. Absolutely incredible stuff to have the gold in his pocket, a full item up still on Waka, who had that great team fight. But I gotta say, if you watched PSG's, uh, PSG's postseason run, you saw a lot of games kind of look like this, where they're a little bit behind. There's late game dragon stacking going on. There's some kind of burger flip of a dragon. Suddenly they have Dragon Soul and they're cleaning up a team fight. I've watched so many of these that like, yeah. if I'm DFM, I know that like we are not out of the woods yet after that initial uh, Baron loss went through. I mean, we talked about this team is almost being like uh, the diet version of EDG 2021, right? With Junja from that squad, with the coach Corky from that squad. And you know that that was a team that loved a team fight. That was a team that no matter what the game state, they could still make the magic happen, so. Like you say, not out of the woods just yet. But, you know, DFM feeling like they've got Robin Hood on their side in the form of Udipon. So maybe the woods is exactly where they want to be. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I was about to it say, like, nice. the, the, the thing is, like, I'm an uncultured American. So, like, when you say something like that, I'm like, is there a reference I'm missing? Like, did out of the woods come from the well, Robin Hood story? He's, or? he's from Sherwood Forest. He, like, lived in the woods. Well, so, yeah, so there you go. See, I am uncultured. The King of Thieves. Or Prince of Thieves, actually. Uh, Toltu could be in trouble here, but uh, Woody just slightly wide on the hook, so won't find his mark. It's Junja constant. I love the way that Junja is constantly like, playing in that fog, trying to get as much information as possible. Yeah, realistically, you know, PSG is not going to brute force a fight here on DFM, but they want to be annoying. They want to make it uh, so that DFM isn't just on autopilot as they shove these lanes over and over again. So Junji are working into the jungle, trying to find these angles, threatening people like Utapon and Arya if they're not paying enough attention. They're like, hey, maybe you can find some way to, to get a, a pick off there. But for the most part, it does feel like, you know, DFM is very comfortable into the uh, push lanes, get wards out, and, and then wait for the next big neutral objective team fight where PSG is going to have to walk into you. I will say, uh, DFM, in terms of Ward's place, is one of the lowest uh, Ward's placing teams in the tournament. Um, now, there is a bit of an interesting correlation in League of Legends where the more you win, actually, the less you need Ward's because you can actually defend your Ward's more. Yeah. Uh, as we see Woody pop his ult there. Bao going to have to dip over the wall. Junja could be in trouble. Might have to use that ultimate himself. The handshake doesn't quite connect. It's Junja's okay. We're setting up for a fight. Once again, Everfrost comes on out, just fighting for those wards. And a single bit of Infernum hits half. It's a third of his health. Yeah, definitely have to be careful. Wako's starting to hurt. He's going to be told to, using the all out, trying to pull Junja into the play, but he gets back towards his team. All ult for all. Yeah, but there's also the commitment of Steel's ultimate there as well. Now there's missing two big ultimates for DFM here, only costing Junjia, who, of course, if he can find a kill, can just grab that one right back up. 
All Out being on cooldown could be an issue as uh, Tall 2 keeps himself safe for the time being. Dragon started and we might just have a 50-50 on our hands still. Yeah, we're gonna flip it. He's gonna need to live up to his name here. The Everfrost has come on through, but it's a fight instead as Tall 2's on the backside, but Wako just shredding through his health bar is dead. It's a good jump from Arya, but it's not good enough. So we do find the kill onto Tol 2, and now we reset back onto the Drake once more. Steel in the pit here. Junja turns gold, and Steel has to try and make the magic happen, but the Got spite's it. there for Junja. It's Soul as Wako charging into the backside. He's got a million shurikens and a dream of a victory as Aria falls. Looking for more onto Steel and Harp. They flee for their lives as another goes to Wako. And PSG, you can just never count them out. We said we saw it coming. PSG there find the monstrous. Soul Point fight, able to absorb the initial engage by DFM there, and then Wako on the back end of that fight, just obliterating Toll 2 and then charging into the front side of it with so many chakrams stacked up. And I feel like we've been talking about this slow, steady gameplay from PSG in general. I feel like that fight was a slow, steady fight. They read the situation, they understood what DFM needed to do, and they played around it. That is some serious, uh, like, Cognizant mind play? I don't even know the word. They're just so smart. Yeah, they made sure they had all their, uh, you know, wards kind of planked out. Aria was clearing a bunch. Yudapon kind of goes on the side, and Ozzy's just doing zoning duty. While Yudapon's not outputting any DPS there because of that zoning, you had Toltu in the middle of the enemy team getting shredded by Wako, who you can see has stacked up so many chakrams. And that's why Junji, I think, is being so aggressive. He wants this fight to keep going before he loses these potential oh, chakrams, works. baiting them in. Oh, man. And then the smite secure their seal forced out. Yeah, you'd have trapped in the pit. On the top side of that play, I didn't see it during the live play, but Woody actually finds a hook onto the invisible steel to force his flash out. So steel just has no way to get back into that. I mean, Wako just doing Wako things to finish the job off as well. Beautiful stuff. And you can see he is tense in the PSG camp, and rightly so, because it's game number one, or series number one, of the tournament, and they are somehow finding themselves in gold touching distance once more. Yeah, gold touching distance, but momentum completely in their favor. The fact that they are up now two dragons with the soul point in their back pocket. Baron as well. Finally, for the first time in forever, it feels like on DFM side of the map, getting vision control down, finally hitting these turrets. There are four turrets that they are behind DFM, so once they start grabbing these, they will slingshot ahead in gold very quickly. You see uh, the damage dealt by AWS there, Wako miles ahead of the competition. Udupon, the only one even close toward his bring to the table. Oh, we're talking about the late game Seri. You can never forget the late game of Felios either. But now using these barrened up cannons to find damage onto the tower. They've still got a full minute of Baron to work with. Full minute of Baron. I think the game plan here for a team like PSG, break this bot lane inhibitor turret and the inhib if you can. Start getting the pressure down the bot side of the map. Have that one open for the entire rest of the game because I don't think PSG is the type of team to want to win a team fight right here and instantly end the game. They're they're very happy with the how the last 10 minutes of this game has gone. There's no need to start rushing it. You've won the last couple of team fights here. Get as much of a gold lead in your favor as you can. You have the soul. You can get ready for Elder as well as you just keep taking down these inner turrets. And we've been talking about how this is a, a rebuilt version of PSG, and that's true comparatively uh, to last year. But I, I want to take a moment to talk about Yubao, because he's actually having a really good game for himself on this Lissandra. He's been solid throughout this entire series so far. And he's actually been to Worlds with PSG before, back when he was called Uniboy. He then had a year in the LPL. This guy is plenty experienced when it comes to international play, not just on the actual international stage, but also going to other regions. And it does feel like today here on the stage, that, that consistency is really showing up. Yeah, he's, he's so good for this team. He played a lot of different styles. He had some insane Tristana games uh, in the kind of postseason run that he had, as well as these more kind of support-oriented ones, things like this Lissandra pick, where your job is about kind of buying space, locking people down for Wako to kind of run through these team fights. And I think that's something that the rest of the team has done extremely well, play around him as their primary carry. But Aji, despite being behind for a lot of this game, uh, did a better job marking targets and trying to find people to uh, isolate from the rest of the team so that DFM doesn't get these big kind of engages and they can chip them down. We're keeping our eyes on Woody as well because in any game that there's a blitz prank, you do just have to keep one weather right on those hooks because it really can just change everything. Like DFM have worked so hard over the last 40 minutes to build themselves a lead and it's been slipping away from them but all of this work, all of this effort can be taken away with a single hook. Junge is invisible, no! Doesn't quite cancel the recall onto Arya and Toltu walks away so close to the pick that could turn the game. Yeah, did have the Banshee's 
Bill would have had to poke that off and then land a bit of damage to stop that recall. But if he were able to do that, find that pick, charge down mid lane maybe. Instead, PSG, you can already see two, three pink wards, excuse me, <laughs> in this dragon area, yeah. getting ready, knowing that this is where the game will be won or lost. DFM moving in now, trying to secure some vision down. I feel like this comes back to the conversation of, you know, we said PSG really, really good on the vision control, really good on objective setup and control. Like, Elder's coming up in a minute's time. We can have no shenanigans. You cannot afford to 50-50 Elder to decide this series. So we need to see that objective control. Like, we've seen it domestically. Let's see it internationally for PSG. Done good so far this tournament. DFM trying their hand at this vision control themselves, working as a unit here. Feels like PSG know they have plenty of time, still 40 seconds before the Baron spawns. Also, multiple ways that they can work in there. With Waco down the bot side, maybe they're going to seed mid lane control and try and work in through the bot lane river. They do have the minion wave relatively far pushed up here. So you can maybe see them work in through this side if they want to. Instead, they're going to go through the jungle. Get into the river. And once they're in the river, I think they feel a lot better not needing to worry about exactly all the angles that DFM keeps on flying over the walls from. So this game could come down to one final team fight. Maybe it started on to steal as Junja goes quite aggressive. Still walks away with his life. A single control ward answered by two by DFM as told to. Tries to find the engage himself, but the Ever Frost denies it once more. Beautiful grouping up with his team as Nadja still in the mid lane right now. Needs to get over to his squad if he wants to be a part of this 5v5. Told to being that bruiser on the front side. Told to goes in. Looks for the fight actually here as he goes for the all out onto Junja. It's not really worked out for them, but Yubao uses his own ultimate to deny that engage. So, kind of a trade of ultimates here. Yubao threatening the all in, but doesn't commit. Junja as well, consistently poking. This feels tense, Mark. Yeah, very tense. Told to his ultimate being down means he has to go back to base. We'll have the ultimate, or excuse me, the teleport to rejoin once he tops his health back up, but that means. Another team fight in a row where he has not been able to find a critical member of the team. Fortunately, the rest of the ultimate is still available for the side of DFM. Pressure is on here, and it feels like PSG are in the driver's seat. DFM are trying to answer. It's told to just jumps into the middle of everyone. Waco still untouched, and told to is almost down, but the Cyclone does manage to get onto the team. It's a GA out from Steel, but Waco's still alive. Take it down on the backside. Aria trying to keep himself alive. The Cyclone doing it. Chaos. Unipon's still going. This Archer tries to shut him down, but it feels like DFM slowly winning the battle of attrition. Junja wants the resets, but denied as Toltu will fall. It's absolute carnage on the rift, but it's DFM that are the kings of chaos. It's DFM that come out on top. DFN win the fight three to five right now. Gonna miss the charm. Should find this kill into Aji in a second here. The question is, are they able to end 30 seconds before Wako and Woody are back alive? Doesn't look like that's gonna be on the table. We'll see if they just grab this soul point and then reset for Baron. Crazy, crazy fight there as DFM all in onto Wako, knowing they had to finish him off and just barely landed the last auto attack by Utapon, I think it was, that found that kill. Absolute insanity in the fight. The gold's still barely different between the teams. It will be an Elder Dragon taken by DFM. Let's go again and try and break down some of this chaos. Yeah, you know that the threat is Wako, so they're willing to all in on top of him. You can see Toltu charging in there, a nice follow up by Steel, landing the knock up, the WE in combo, and then Unipon has hopped the wall. Arya has used all his alt charges to charge forward into that fight, knowing he's going to get low, but that last attack by Unipon finishing him off, making them commit more resources, he will drop as well, but not after they've gotten so much AoE damage out that the biggest carries are already down. And then this last charm that Arya is going to land is absolutely huge. I don't know if we'll have time to get to the rest of this team fight because we're already onto the Baron now for the side of PSG. No time for team fighting. The Elder is in play for DFM. This is bold from PSG to try and go for the Baron. Junja actually ults over the wall to take the objective. Aria is off on the side in the meantime in a 1v3. The Elder burn and Woody's taken out of the picture. What a play from Aria. Very heads up play by Aria there, knowing the rest of the team can't get in time to contest the Baron. Instead, waits on the exit path to try and land a kill onto someone. Did miss the charm on Wako, but Woody was low enough then. He had enough damage to finish him off, and now it's a 4v5 charge and up the mid lane. Who cares about Baron when you've got a man advantage in a minute and a half on Elder Dragon? This is everything DFM needed to keep themselves in the series. After a heartbreaker of a mid game, after a monumental early game, perhaps this is enough for them to take PSG out and push us to game number three. Juncha on the front line will be taken down. Big damage coming across the team as Waka wide on his ultimate, but the Gale Force is there. He's Steel alive. will fall. It's one for one between the teams, and Waka wants a little bit more. 
Waco wants a little bit more. They do find the kill onto Steel. They did end up dropping him there. So now it's a 4v3, both junglers down. Woody back alive. This is getting very scary for DFM. Man, Waco is a living turret. DFM can't even go close to the guy without getting shredded. Aria, all over the wall. Waco trying to clear the wave as fast as possible, but it's Woody caught out again. As Toll 2 dives under the tower, answers with his own life, and again, one for one. This is absolute insanity. The fact that you saw Toll 2 trying to charge into Waco, who is still at full health, setting the team up, hopefully, but he ends up dropping support for top laner, obviously favors PSG, and that's finally what gets DFM out of their base. I feel like DFM are in a raid right now, and all of the other players of PSG are like the ads, and then Waco is the final boss, and he is taking them apart. Definitely in the late game rage mode of the boss. Took too long <laughs> yeah. to finish him off. Starts doing extra damage, it feels like. Waco is an absolute beast right now. Able to keep his team alive, finding the kills both onto Steel and Toll 2 there. But does speak to the fact that this game is still very much alive. DFM have the team fighting tools to win this one. I really like the all-in commitment here to Jinjia. They're trying to end this game. They don't want to go later, and so if you're going to do that, you have to uh, burn down the side of Jinjia there. Go ahead. But here, getting a little bit too low. This ultimate yeah. does go wide, but the Gale Force auto in forces the uh, res there. But <laughs> you see there's nothing you can do, so just instant to the turret. It's still yeah. acknowledging no way to find a kill. And I've got to say, London, are you not entertained? Make some noise for Waco and the performance he is putting on to keep PSG in this game. But DFM, they're not done just yet. They are never out of the game. The chaos that they bring and the chaos of these fights, that's their strength. That is where they draw their power. Baron about to time out here. Elder not up for another three minutes. The same for Baron. No neutrals to talk about. And the question is, can you find a pick with Blitzcrank? Can you find a pick with the Ari? What, what is going to happen? <laughs> it's also crazy when you have both those late game neutral objectives spawning the same oh! time. Whoa. <laughs> that was dicey. I wonder if that was one of those, uh-oh, the bigger blast cone. Yeah. It wasn't ready for the Chemtech blast cone that far forward. Able to be okay, though, for uh, Toll 2 there. So we see a big standoff ARAM in the mid lane. Both yeah. teams with hooks. If any of these skill shot lands, you can find the game over very quickly. But I was about to say, with both of the uh, neutral deck just spawning at the same time, PSG yeah. is a team that actually has played a ton of very, very late game scenarios. I think this is a situation where for a lot of teams, your games usually end before this point, your scrims never get to this point, so yeah. the amount of practice you've actually had from the situation is quite limited. And if for a team like DFM who's so dominant that they, they usually yeah. win their games much earlier than this, PSG might have a small advantage in that experience pool because they are very used to oh. seeing Elder Dragons. Junja does get caught by the charm here. Arya, good bit of damage, but it's going to matter too much. The Honey Fruit comes on through. Steel can't quite find his target. The Cyclone does get a bit of follow-up. Everfrost coming out. I believe that was actually from Woody. As he manages to disengage the play. And like you say, not many teams do see that. PSG certainly do. And that team we were talking about before, EDG 2021, that they took Junja from, that they took Corgi from. And I did just notice Waco actually using the uh, EDG Aphelio skin from that year as well. <laughs> the it does feel like they're channeling that late game power that that team was so very well known for. Got to say, though, Steel also taking one of those empowered blast cones, maybe going a little bit too far, and had to flash out there. So almost all summoners are available in this game. Obviously, Yubao, the fact that he's on the unsealed spellbook, has Exhaust Ignite, so you can swap those around. But uh, now that's the only major summoner down for Steel, which is one of their critical team fight uh, champions. You saw the, the one that they won at Elder was because he was able to basically commit everything to getting on top of Wako, having yep. less mobility to do so now. Very scary stuff. And it's worth mentioning, before we get to this fight that's potentially up in a minute's time, Junja sparring already, Steel Hunt. No, it's the clone. The clone. Woo. I thought that was the real one for just a split second there. We do have a Renata in this game. We're on a six item of Felios. If that hostile takeover hits Waco, he can two shot his team if he's got Infernum on. Like, this is dangerous territory. Keep your eyes on what Harp's bringing to the table. He's rooted by Yubao, though, to start this fight off. And already Yubao using his ultimate. Junja has to just abandon his mid laner. They're trying to trade for Toll 2. But in the meantime, Yubao's going to go down. DFM starts strong, but Toll 2 does go down. And now the follow up from Waco as well. The Moonlight Vigil onto Harp, but they don't have the damage to finish the kills off. Charm goes wide. And PSG try and make a play for the mid lane.
Top for mid, both AD carries alive right now. Toltu buying space for his team, overextended a little bit, and Harp again not quite able to land a huge hostile takeover. Tagged some members of PSG on the back end, but not the Aphelios. The hook lands! Oh! It's the real one this time, a huge hook from Woody Steel. Half HP has the GA to work with, the cask not enough. The shield Ignite. saves the play, and Steel somehow gets away with the skin of his teeth. Yeah, but he doesn't have enough time to go back to base to heal, so he's trying to life steal a little bit off these jungle camps before, because the Elder Dragon Dragon has respawned. Half health on the Elder already. They do this so fast with red and white weapons for Wako. Junja needs to find his smite. Steel could live up to his name here as Aja over the wall. Steel found alone. The clone goes down. The knockup is there. GA procced. This could be it for PSG as Steel found wanting and taken down. Aria next to try and save his jungler, but Wako flashes after him. The, the Calibrum not quite there to finish the job, but Unipon left alone. And suddenly, nowhere to go. Udupon will go down, and PSG take their elder as their reward. PSG, in the tensest of moments, finding ways to play these fights out. Steel not having time to heal after a monster hook by Woody forced him low. That was the impetus for that whole situation. And now, with the elder on, looks like they're going to try and end. Easy cleanse there by Wako. All comes across the team, but it's not enough. Yubao charging forwards. And with Elder, you've got to believe that this is it, unless some kind of miracle can save DFM. As the PCS show up to MSI once again with great expectations and a great reality. PSG go 2-0 in their first game. They wipe DFM despite a tough early game. And they show us why they must be feared. PSG in the opening match of MSI 2023 find a 2-0